Want to be more thorough while also working faster? It doesn't matter if you're on the red or blue team, an augmented reality overlay can enable you to be more thorough and faster at the same time. No glasses, no goggles, Polarity delivers this superpower as an overlay on top of your existing workflow and tools. The free community edition connects to the data you care about to overlay the context you need to make informed decisions. Apply for early access today at securityweekly.com forward slash polarity. Qualys has brought together vulnerability management and patch management, letting security teams discover vulnerabilities and apply patches immediately, all within a single unified app. Sign up for a free trial of Qualys VMDR, vulnerability management, detection, and response today at securityweekly.com forward slash Qualys. Welcome back, everyone, to Paul's Security Weekly. If you've got a specific guest or topic that you'd like us to cover on one of the shows, you can submit your suggestions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guest. Complete the form. We review those on a regular basis. Also, if you happen to miss Security Weekly Unlocked, you can access all of the content on demand. Whether you registered for the live event or not, Visit securityweekly.com forward slash unlocked. Log in if you already have credentials or register to consume that content. And now on to the security news for this week. Uh, what do you say we start with the poisoning the water hole, so to speak? Wasn't that from Toy Story? There we go. Yeah. Poison the water hole. That's what I thought of when I read this story. So was it Take was it, it just um, Patrick Gray had the best uh, headline for Risky Business, and he was like, "Was it Iran or was it Florida man?" And it even rhymes, <laughs> so I won't lay claim <laughs> to that headline. That was Patrick Gray from Risky Business. So what do you think? Was it Iran or Florida man, Tyler? I I'm still gonna go with this. Feels a lot like a a criminal or just some one off hacker and. It's really interesting that we are very quick to attribute things to certain groups or nation states. Anytime there's a breach, anytime there's some attack, they call it sophisticated. And half the time, they're really not sophisticated attacks. Yep. And this one's kind of no different. Uh, but no one is making a claim. Uh, and maybe that's because of, there's kinetic you know, uh, involvement and there's – if something was attributed, there had to be some very heavy action. But the fact that we're not making any attribution to a nation state or some sophisticated actor, actor uh, I think that's a little bit telling, but also very curious is why we're not jumping to that. Uh, I mean, it's it's Team Viewer. There's several uh, nation state actors that have used Team Viewer. I mean, we we abuse Team Viewer. It's a, a great product, but there are ways to abuse it, and we've we've used it as a remote access tool for a long time. Right. Um, but. This uh, this one, there's nothing super sophisticated about it, other than the fact that they knew what was poison and kind of how to access yeah that's uh, those SCADA going. controls, which like, is interesting. We get to speculate with absolutely zero evidence, right? Because we're a podcast and we can just well, do course. that. Of course, I mean we don't need evidence. We're just it's pure speculation at this point. But the two things that I'm drawn to that they knew that they could and how maybe to increase the levels of sodium hydroxide did i get that right or lie in the in the water mm -hmm. which is the chemical they introduce as a part of a cleaning agent right is that part of the the uh, filtration process uh when you're processing water is it my is i'm it, just it, happy i'm on a well that's all there you go yeah, yeah. uh so well, well. but it was interesting when i read the article it was like Normally, I think it was a hundred parts per million was the normal range, and they increased it to like eleven hundred. So it's almost like they right. like you know added eleven thousand. Eleven thousand, right? So they like added a, a, a just a basic number in in front of that to uh, to increase it. I don't know, you know, all the reports say the operators noticed that the cursor was moving and they weren't moving the mouse. So I don't know if it was a time based thing. Well, they thought someone could be watching. I got to make this change quick. So let me just put an a, a 11 in there. The other thing was that the, the city or, or, or county or town in Florida that this was near was very near the Super Bowl and it was around the time of the Super Bowl. And, and mm -hmm. you know, maybe both those things point to me like someone that maybe had done their research uh, to understand okay, if I were to gain control of an HMI that control the water system, what might I do? Uh, to turn this into an attack in the real world. Secondly, where might I want to target this attack? Well, maybe a town near the super where the Super Bowl is happening is going to have a lot more people 
in it and you know therefore i might be able to affect more people with my attack yeah i mean that's that's one thing about it is it's definitely targeted right because in order to gain access via team viewer uh, and i'm assuming they it, it hasn't been real clear on how they gained access to team viewer right and if that was how they accessed it or they were just monitoring from team viewer i've read kind of several stories and they, they, they don't all line up uh, yeah. the same way um, but if it was TeamViewer, then, you know, credential stuffing or password spraying, then they would have to have a very specific email address to begin doing that. And if that's the case, then that's a very targeted attack. Yep. If yeah. that's not Tyler, the case, I, then they I, have I, some others. Yeah, Tyler, I heard something about it being like unprotected TeamViewer, unpassworded TeamViewer or something. Um, I don't know. Like can that. you do that? I don't think you can do that. I don't, I don't, I don't, I have no idea. I don't think you can, but, I've uh, used TeamViewer pretty extensively for probably a better part of <laughs> over a decade. Uh, both sure. offensively and defensively. So, um, and, uh, so Paul, the other oh, sorry, Lee, real quick, the other one that uh, that Paul you said the the targeted, you know, the attacks, you know, my immediate, you know, and and I hate to make this political, and my camera keeps freezing, which is super awesome. Um, is that like my initial thoughts were like, is this the water supply that supplies Mar-a-Lago? Mm-hmm. Mm. that was actually the, one of the first things i was yeah. thinking of too larry yeah but it is completely not it is not mm -hmm. oh okay so so Me? when uh so my number nine is the uh the the cert alert that came out this afternoon I'm, oh well i'm not ready to move on yet hold on that is the same story oh, same, same yeah same, okay, topic, same story same topic, okay it goes yeah. with it yeah. good that it, it's you know comp you know cert compromise of u.s water treatment facility and they focused on desktop sharing and um windows 7 end of life mm. which i thought was an interesting indicator of where the bar was so we turn this blue pack. <laughs> so there that I, but I keep coming back to why the hell was this so accessible i mean come on guys you need to harden the internet accessible to to a control system no they don't so this was this was team they should. team viewer on the HMI that yeah. controls the water facility that was connected to the internet and exposed to the internet can yep. either with a password that could be guessed perhaps or maybe with no password easily guessable or password sprayed or consumed from other means right well I right. had a, a a funny thought and a, and a serious thought the funny thought was and I'm I'm crossing streams a little bit but uh uh, in a previous conversation today with people at work, we were talking about uh, you know unsupported operating systems and what you have to do to get by that. And and uh, well, actually, I, I take it back. Uh, the 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 Wednesday night happy hour call, Paul, that you've been to yeah, once yeah. or twice. Um, you know, this was the pretty much the main topic last night, and mm -hmm. they were talking about uh, a lot of you know a lot of uh, you know companies like the, you know water treatment facilities, which are you know fall under critical infrastructure, which everybody's concerned about, and yet it's not regulated. That's sort of the serious mm -hmm. thought. But but we were talking about how you know they use old equipment, and 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 I was thinking when you were talking about you know somebody noticed the the you know the cursor moving. I'm like. Well, yeah, like it used to happen in what version of Windows, you know, some what which old operating system, which is probably the operating system they were using. So it's it's you know it's good thing that they noticed the 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 drift because you know that happened you know, in older versions of, of Windows. But the but to to what I was uh, uh, saying to Lee uh, or pushing back on Lee on, yeah, they should. But this is a largely an unregulated industry uh, because it's a public utility. Therefore, it's paid for by the government. And, and I was asking the question last night, and there was a lot of you know D DHS people on this call, a lot of mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of government people on this call that know the ins and outs. And I said, well, you know, what compliance standard do they have to follow? Crickets. Mm. And and yep. to me, that's the heart of the problem. You know, so uh, should they? Yes, but they're not going to unless they have to. And anything they do, somebody's got to pay for it, and that's going to impact. You know, that's where it becomes political because it, 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 you know, there has to be funding for it. All right. What I mean, is water, this funding, Mister Mystery? You talk of funding. What's that? <laughs> well, water uh, no, treatment I'm, I'm typically actually, comes I agree with you. City, city, I do city agree or with you. Government, right? So those are all paid for by property tax, typically. 
And Not always. Those, those are typically ran by a, a much lower resourced IT uh, staff that, that may or may not have, you know, they may be managing most of the county or most of the city. Uh, and remote access is something I've seen a ton, especially in, yeah. in county government. So, yeah, you're, you're right. It is usually uh, local city government, which are even less funded within the higher levels of government. Hey, shout out yeah. to Hacks for Pancakes. She was quoted in an article about this, and uh, she made me LOL out, out loud because she mentioned how you know a lot of these facilities, they have maybe one or two IT guys, and they're drowning in what they have to do. I was like, oh, was <laughs> She made a dad like, joke. <laughs> <laughs> she did. <laughs> I just want to, you know, I think this is an opportunity, Jeff, to your point, to put a call out so that there is proper funding and resources to, you know, Leslie's comment uh, as well, that uh, there needs to be more resources in both people and funding for these organizations. Because if we look back in, in history and we go back to our favorite Stuxnet, and how they were able to affect a, uh, a critical infrastructure or industrial control system in this Stuxnet attack, when it was a nation state, they wanted to be stealthy about it. They wanted to disrupt the control system, have it, it, have it negatively impacted in the physical world, but appear to the operators that everything was okay. And if there you know, was indications, have that be blamed on some kind of other, you know, error or other kind of mistake or, or mishap, not have them lead to believe that it was in fact, uh, you know, malicious software that was run by nation state hackers, for lack of a better term. In this so, case, you know, they saw the mouse moving get... and they saw that the levels were changing and they just changed them back. I think had this been a nation state attack <clears throat> that had the appropriate resources that the operator wouldn't have seen, everything would have looked normal to the operator, except the levels of sodium hydroxide in the water may have changed. Now, they did say that there are other measures down the line where that stuff is measured that. and there's safeguards against that. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, that. what if they had but, not seen that too? Yeah. But well, there's I'll, other I'll safeguards. You, I, I was trying to look through some of my old archive of stuff, but I couldn't find a floppy drive reader. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I had a customer. I'm guessing it was at least 20 years ago that was a water treatment facility. Uh, the one time I actually did a social engineering, you know, physical hack, and it, and it wasn't really intentional, but we were in another state. We had a rental van that was like a nondescript white van, and there was a, a it was a large campus because you know water treatment. They're mm -hmm. all spread out on acres of the you know whatever they call the things, uh, and we got you know we drove up to the the security checkpoint at the perimeter fence, and the guy just kind of waved us through. And we're like, okay, I guess he thinks, you know, we look like we're a utility truck or, you know, they, they must have worker, people. Yeah, contractor. And, uh, you know, so we got up to the main building, parked in the guest parking lot, walked in. Of course, we had, you know, computer bags, backpacks, whatever. That was poor, before backpacks were cool. Mm. Um and, you know, we kind of walked up to the front door and was kind of looking for a doorbell. We tried it and it was open and there was nobody around. So we just kind of kept walking just to kind of, eh, how far can we get? And we got all the way through whatever the hallway was, all the way back into the, the area where the big pools were. And mm -hmm. we're like, wow, you know, this is kind of not good, which became part of our report. I mean, we were right. there to do a, a pen test. But uh, we were doing, you know, we were there to do the on-site portion. Um, but that was 20-some years ago. Uh, so not not a lot has changed, but duh, not a lot has changed. Mm. That's I mean, kind of scary. I, I did one very much more recent than that, and that was essentially the exact same thing. Same result? <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, but – but my point is, they're you know they're not regulated. They're, they you know they're 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 government at some level. So maybe they're supposed to be doing, you know, some sort of NIST or maybe uh, you know. But <clears throat> good regulation help that, right? Like so, a lot of these places, the vendor just comes in and installs the system, installs all the PLC, uh, does all the config <clears throat> the configurations. <coughs> Excuse me, and once that's done. City employees don't know how to reconfigure that, how to secure that, how to maintain upkeep. Once it's deployed, it's done. Right. Yeah, they're well, the, they're and, the, the and, traditional and, operators in, in that sense. 
<laughs> and where we were probably different, Tyler, was when we were looking at it, and we didn't call it uh, industrial control systems back then. But you know, all the all the switches that were all on the 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 gates that open and close, valves and things like that, they're all remotely controlled back twenty years ago by mm. modem. So, did you war dial? Probably not. Could be still valid uh, today. <laughs> they're, they're probably still out there, frankly. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. Jeff, That's sometimes yes. remind me to tell you the story about war dialing in a past life. Like, <sighs> I mean, banks banks still war use war. modems for for the core banking applications. Like, this is something that we've seen. You know, this is still very very standard for most of the core applications. So, any of the core banks uh, uh, utilizes still. So, it's still a very real threat, and it's still something that is has to be used in order to uh, validate that risk and and what could happen. Was it well, around the little... time of uh, September 11th that there was a like an alert issued that water facilities had to uh, be on high alert? Because of physical attacks uh, against was that was that yeah. around September 11th time frame? Yeah, mm -hmm. shortly after. Shortly after. Shortly after, right? Yeah, yeah. I well, mean, that was we went to DefCon four or five or whatever, and that was included. Mm. Yep. Yes. I I I I agree. I think regulation certainly is is needed here in some uh, level well, of inspection for compliance to those regulations, Jeff. I mean, you know, go back to well, PCI and other, most, and other standards, right? Well, and it's not exactly private sector. In the private sector, if you get, you know, we talk about this all the time. The more mature organizations are the ones that have been re regulated the longest. Um, the ones that aren't regulated, they're only going to do what they have to do mm -hmm. or or do what they have to do to clean up after they've been popped. But, uh, you know, and at some level, it's a sound business to say, why should we spend money? Nobody's making us spend the money. We're not going to do it just because, you know, and, and you can apply pressure and, you know, try to do boycotts or whatever. But the bottom line is, if it's not regulated, most companies aren't going to do it. Now, make it a public sector that's underfunded and, and, and you know, a lot of automation already in terms of the industrial control systems. They don't have a whole lot of people at the plant. And, uh, you know, so they don't have the budget for it. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to have the budget until some some regulation says that they have to. Right. Yeah, it was a very depressing uh, happy hour last night at the end of the day. Mm. Oh. Uh, where do we want to go next? Let's stick with depressing and talk about the silicon chip chip shortage. I don't I don't know how this does, I don't know if this relates to security directly necessarily, but uh, I, I'm following the story because if you've tried to buy any types of processors or things that have processors, uh, good luck trying to get a new Xbox Series X or S uh, or a PlayStation Five. Um, Heaven forbid you want a new NVIDIA RTX 30 series, because uh, those, and, and even <laughs> now some of the like older cars. I mean, I I can't find much of anything at, at a reasonable price. I should say what stock does become available is snapped up quickly by bots, in my assessment, and then put back on the market at around a 30, 30 to 40 ish, and it varies uh, price increase. Uh, which kind of defeats the purpose, in, in my mind, a lot of these new processors. AMD processors certainly fall uh, in this, the third generation AMD processors, which the uh, AMD and NVIDIA RTX 30 series for the money is just uh, amazing. And now also we've got to compete with uh, now the new laptops that are coming out are being bought up by Bitcoin miners. Uh, I saw a couple of stories where they're using laptops to do that. Uh, I can see the Bitcoin miners one in the new RTX 30 series too. Um, I mean... Yep. This has got this has got a lot more implications than just, you know, the drive of tech to and supply and demand. The the thing that people don't really consider is a lot of the geopolitical aspects that are happening in the world and and things that, that we may not even see in the news in America uh, all tie back into this. Mm. Uh, rare earth metals are one of the components used in in silicon chips and used in processors and, and basically all of our ele modern electronics. Uh, this rare earth metal is only mined in in very specific geographical regions. Africa oh, being one of them. I was going to say Africa, and right? Ven is, Venezuela. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. 
So the government overthrow in Venezuela and a lot of the coup attempts and geopolitical aspects of China coming in, causing disruption, Russia making a play at it. Uh, even us, there's rumors of us funding uh, certain candidates or overthrowing you know, different groups there, uh, causing unrest because that leaves the mines that are trying to be profited from. Uh, open for us to take, you know, and we don't want obviously China or Russia to have those. Mm. So there's a lot more aspects to this than simply supply and demand. That uh, again, yeah. we're not we're not thinking about from our side of of the geopolitical stance. Wow, that's interesting. I I, I heard about that in another podcast somewhere. I don't remember which one. Uh, and then there's also the you know the container ships that are floating in the water off of California, uh, filled containers filled with electronics that can't offload because of COVID restrictions on the unloading docks. Right. And some yeah, of them are Go ahead, guys. Well, to, to, I mean, just to, the, the article, it's somewhat a si supply and demand thing, but it's it's attributing it to, you know, all the slowdown and, and shutdown that occurred because of COVID-19. In the automobile that, industry, you know, right? In yeah, the automobile correct. industry specifically, but had the mm. ripple effect of the companies making the chips, slowed production, and retooled their, you know, assembly mines to make other things. And, right. and so it's it, it's an interesting sort of white-collar example of the ripple effect uh, yep. that, you know, COVID lockdowns cause. It's a lot different from... Uh, but not then like, you know, it's all the ballparks that have, you know, you know, we didn't have baseball this past year. So what happened to all the local bars outside of all, all the stadiums and all mm. the people selling mm -hmm. hot dogs and Cracker Jack and all the stadiums, all the part-time workers. And I, I had to, I might've said this on the other, I, uh, on the other week, but I, again, I drove up to the airport, uh, my old, my old commute and, and driving past, uh, you know, the satellite lots that were not only empty, but closed, mm. you know, so thousands of parking spaces empty at the airport. And it's like, you know, the little restaurants, the gas stations, half of them are closed around the airport. So yeah, uh, we're going to be feeling the effects of this. Yeah for a long right. long time yeah and i i it, it's a great point jeff it's not just we can't build gaming pcs right there's a far more reaching and other uh yeah. pressing matters and it right. doesn't i mean it, it impacts yeah. our business and, uh, and, and not I, all businesses in the same way right but like mm -hmm. i would totally already have built a new system for processing video but like i can't get the new card so i like i'm not gonna do that right, right? i'm not gonna pay a premium i know, lee, I, I know lee's got a comment and i've got one too so lee so I was seeing along the same lines as, you know, as a manufacturer, I could sell the components for one gaming machine or maybe a thousand laptops now. And I'm going to go make the components for the laptops because I got all these people now needing them from home. Right, right. But, <coughs> but and, and as Tyler said, it's there's all kinds of other aspects meeting in here, too, to include mm -hmm. the container ships, the supply, the availability, the rare earth metals, the and even the workers that run the factory, even though they're largely automated, they're still people needed. Yep. Yep. And it's it's not just the the silicon for the chips for your your graphics cards and that type of stuff. I mean, I think the the example that hits me sort of close to home is that uh, Sans uh, would give every student a USB thumb drive when they took a course, uh, and they're not shipping USB thumb drives. And it's not because everybody is working from home. It's that literally the suppliers from china cannot yep. supply the amount of usb thumb drives that sans mm -hmm. requires because they don't have the stock of them mm -hmm. so it's Crazy, scary it? it's scary especially for us tech nerds right <laughs> for sure uh it, it, jeff i i found a story that i thought uh you'd like it's called a simple and yet robust hand cipher i really like mm -hmm. uh in this article how they uh, are kind of using it to kid, get uh, kids kind of excited about uh, using crypto and in, uh, uh, in, in thing in ciphers, and they came up with uh, it is a you know detailed story about how they use the number pad on the phone um, to uh, use as a, a cipher pad basically, and then mm -hmm. uh, one of the kids was like, well, I just want to encode a message so only my best friend can read it and not everyone else. Uh, and how they did, you know, they shifted the the cipher basically uh, so that they could do that. And he kind of uh, coined this term keypad crypt. It's a hand cipher, a manual method for encryption without a computer. Uh, it's a basic substitution cipher that replaces each letter with a number. And the numbers are chosen from uh, a phone pad. I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, 
Okay, you thought it was cool. Uh, so let me use this as a little object lesson here for a little bit about cryptography. Uh, you know, it's a very lengthy article, mm. and I didn't read into it so much that it was meant for kids. It was inspired by a kid, right? Where where the kid said, "Hey, there's letters on my my phone keypad. I could just." type in the numbers and that would translate to the words and people could figure out and this guy took that and built upon it and and tr you know came up with some very complicated methods of uh, figuring out how to randomize the order of the letters that right. are put on the each of the you know so you got 10 numbers to work with right um, and, and I was reading along, and I was following along and following along. It's like, okay, this is interesting. How are you going to add the complexity? And they started talking about, well, we need to add complexity, and and so they they you know they started adding more than just letters, which is you know twenty six characters. They added numbers. They added punctuation, creating the 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 character set. Um, where it falls apart is. Uh, uh johnny that's your cue i guess um i i kept thinking okay there's got to be more to it than that and they they gave an example of how they used their very complicated convoluted way of randomizing the way the letters show up on the on the keypad and and what they ended up doing is uh, they use two digits. The first digit is the digit, zero through nine on the keypad. And the second digit is the order. It, you know, if there's one, two, or three, or four characters on the number, it tells right. you which position it is. Mm -hmm. So the end result is it becomes simple substitution. I don't really care how you came up with the the random randomization. It doesn't matter if you – and this is right out of the article. If you look at it um, – uh, you know, the way a cryptanalyst used to would would solve this is, is you look at the frequency of the letters. E is the most common letter in the in the in the English language. So look at what the E's they substitute in this instance to zero three. If you look across the bottom, if you did a count, zero three happens more often than not. So if I was looking at just the numbers, I'd say, well, three happens a lot. Let's see if that's an E. Mm. And then if you look at the very beginning, 12, 61, 01, 92, 94, and then you flip over to the right because you know the, the you become you believe it's a repeat of the same characters. So there's patterns that mm -hmm. are emergence. Now the one thing I would say is, and and it did trip me up for a little bit, but you know because they 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 actually had a character for the space. Yeah. Uh, you know that it's that the same, that yeah. would, same number that would trip you up a little bit but still it, it's it's a it's a pattern and, and this is a pretty short a, a, a version but you know trust me if you were if you were writing a paragraph uh or even a longer sentence that actually said anything this is you know trivial to solve mm. um and and you know what i read from the article was you know he's trying to come up with uh, something that's easy to use in terms of, you know, everybody's got a keypad. So it's, it, he was sort of on the right track. The mm -hmm. trick is you got to come up with the key. You got to come up with a way of randomizing it, given that it's something that everybody can have. And the goal was to be able to come up with a way of having a secret coded message, a, a ciphered message, without having to use a computer. You could do this by hand. You could do it in your head, which is true, but... Uh, you're not providing a whole lot of security. If you look at this, you can, you, you know, it, it, it's, it's simple. This is a Caesar cipher. Mm -hmm. It's just not a letter, right. letter uh, substitution. It's a character. And, and so all the pattern recognition, all the, uh, all the frequencies of letters in the English language are all going to spill out and be apparent. None of that is hidden or suppressed or masked, which, uh, is something that a one-time pad does. A one-time pad where you add a stream of random, you're you're negating the effect of letter frequency and, mm. and patterns and, and whatnot, which is why one-time pads, one of the reasons why one-time pads are unsolvable. Um, so it was an interesting article up to the point where I'm like, okay, but it's just simple substitution. <laughs> right. And and I'm glad I, I brought it to your, I'm glad I, this is why I brought it to your attention, Jeff. Right, yeah. 
But the guy spent a long, I mean, 90, 95% of the article was mm. coming up with this convoluted way, secret way based on a code. And each person has to have a code. And he had all sorts of, he had this weird, strange algorithm and, and different ways of applying the algorithm to the, uh, to the alphabet to randomize putting it up. I'm like, okay. But at the end of the day, it's simple substitution. The object lesson is cryptography is very, very hard mm. because you can get you can get all wrapped up around the axle thinking you're doing some great, amazing things, uh, and and yet it isn't necessarily very complex when, when you you know when when you're done. The awesome. end. That's awesome. end of the lesson. Awesome. <laughs> For uh, a good example, Jeff, your interview on uh, Jack Resider show, Darknet Diaries, uh, you covered the the one time pad. I thought very yep. well. Thank you. Uh, Everybody should listen to it. Episode eighty three. Um, so I'm thinking I need my Annie Oakley Dakota ring for this cipher. You don't need much more than that. Mm. And and it's a commercial, right? Drink more Ovaltine. Drink more. There we exactly. Go. Yep. Uh, where do we want to go next? Um, somewhat related to uh, cryptography. Border agents can search phones freely under new circuit court ruling. Now, I thought we had this nailed. I thought That's e scary. E right? I thought EFF went to bat for all of us. There was a big hoo ha about if I show up at the U.S. border, uh, what 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 can can they search my devices or not? And I, I thought largely there was a lot of uh, fighting, and we we landed on that we had some protections there. This U.S. court ruling has reversed that. So a new U.S. appeals court has ruled that Customs and Border Protection agents can conduct in-depth searches of phones and laptops, overturning the earlier legal victory. Um, First Circuit Judge Sandra Lynch declared that both basic and advanced, air quotes, advanced searches, which include reviewing and copying data without a warrant, fall within permissible constitutional grounds at the American border. This is a bad precedent, this is in bad. my yeah. opinion. This is bad. So, yeah, Paul, if you think about that, that hundred it covers within 100 miles of, the, of a border. That that means uh, Maine, Vermont, New Hampshire, Massachusetts, and Rhode Island all fit within those borders. Mm -hmm. So CBP has the uh, authority to uh, inspect any suspicious device. Uh, there's also comments that uh, any international 100 miles of any international airport, uh, which effectively covers the greater majority of the United States, in which CBP has the ability to do those types of things. I looked for commentary from the EFF on, on this ruling, and I had not found it yet. I didn't look very hard. I mean, I went to their website and looked. I didn't see any comment yet. And and this is not just for foreign nationals coming into the U.S. This is for this is U.S. Anyone. citizens. Mm -hmm. Anyone. Which, knowing how much I travel internationally, what I have on my laptop from customer data and, like, just a viability of, like, maintaining and being able to say that that data is secured and, and inaccessible by any other party other than authorized – that right there, we're going to have problems. Mm -hmm. Like, do I give up a pin? Do I give up my my, uh, my BitLocker boot up pin? What if I refuse? Like, are we back to that whole game? Like, this is just, this is stupid. <laughs> You're going to Guantanamo Bay, my friend. I mean, according to this new not ruling. the first time. <laughs> <laughs> wow. This mm. is bad. I hope, I hope we, can, we can work to get back to where we were before. To be honest, technically, I think Tyler would go to Leavenworth, but that's just a hunch. Yes, that would probably be Leavenworth, or some unnamed underground facility somewhere that no. Well, one's they can ever detain had. you for for quite a while without yep. having to take you anywhere, which sucks. So that's that's another thing. I mean, watching the the Border Patrol show on the TV the other day, my kids showed me they're like, "Dad, can they actually take your phone like that and go search it?" And they walked away with the dude's phone unlocked and they required it, and I was like. No, I don't think they can do that. That actually is illegal. I don't know how they're getting away with it. Yeah, but not anymore. <laughs> apparently, that is a thing. It's an atrocity. Mm -hmm. uh, more? Do we have an atrocity to to kind of go off on? I don't know. If there's any more necessarily atrocities uh, in the news. Let's talk about something more positive. Google launches an open source vulnerabilities database. 
Uh, they say, we're excited to launch the OSV or, uh, open source vulnerabilities. Their first step towards improving vulnerability triage for developers and consumers. Um, its goal is to provide precise data on where a vulnerability was introduced, where it got fixed, helping consumers of open source software accurately identify if they are impacted and make security fixes uh, quickly and as soon as possible. It's pretty good. I was looking at some of the... If you read the article, they link to... Uh, what is it like? OSV.dev? Is that the... Yeah, OSV.dev uh, is the website. And uh, it's kind of like an, an API. It's an API that you query, basically. Uh, and they've got a little demo uh, on how you query for certain uh, package names and such. And it'll tell you about all the vulnerabilities. That was pretty That's cool. pretty nice because yeah. I think some of the some of the other ones are getting a little outdated, and mm. I just don't care for the format. Like, do you see a lot of the CVE releases, and you end up going to some of the offensive ones, like you know VulnDB or or one of the others, just to get right. info on particular ones. So you know Google Project Zero has been releasing probably some of the best vulnerabilities to yeah. date, mm-hmm. uh, and having some you know one of their teams over there kind of managing and pulling some of that in. I think that's a I think it's a good a good move and something that's going to be a valuable resource. Agreed. I mean there are commercial vendors that do it and I think that their enterprise features warrant certainly their product suite and we've interviewed and been sponsored by the, you know those companies they do a great job. Um, but if you kind of want to just have something you can query on your own, I think it should be open, right? I think it the information wants to be free about where vulnerabilities are. I think that's important for, for public safety. Um, let's see. Has anyone played Cyberpunk 2077? Mm-mm. I wish I could say I had the no. time because that game is amazing. That's what I've heard. I've not played it either, Larry. I've heard there were some pretty hilarious bugs where, like, you know, there's mm-hmm. trees in people's faces, like some pretty hilarious stuff. I, I mean- and it's a pretty progressive game in that, like, it's one of, the, and they got a lot of flack for it. It's like mm. one of the first games that allows you to select the size of your genitals on character creation. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's very like Leisure Suit Larry if you're old school or mm-hmm. there uh, you go. There, GTA, some, some Grand Theft Auto, like Grand Theft Auto kind of ish, right? Yep. Yep. But Cyberpunk, like, total, like, very much immersion cyberpunk type of stuff. So, yeah, I like the culture side of of it, like just seeing some of the videos and kind of the whole culture and the aesthetics of, of what they've done to the game is is definitely a very like early '90s hacker theme mm. and, uh, with yes. with some some new cyber in it. But I mean, I, if I, I, had that, I heard it that runs 30 great. Thirty series but, card, I would be playing. Right, I was gonna say I heard it runs great in the RTX Thirty series, which yeah. which can't. <laughs> Hey, as a as a side note, since we're talking about early '90s hackers, uh, all the shows are on hiatus next week. But uh, the following uh, Tuesday, which is the 23rd, on Security and Compliance Weekly, we are going to have as a, a, a guest uh, one of the original members of Masters of Deception. Oh, nice, nice! And That's all awesome. of the shows are on hiatus next week. Yes, that's correct. Oh. Cool. All right. <laughs> All right. Hey, Larry. Awesome. No. You, you yeah. got next week off. Next week, we yeah, we have off. Um, Sweet. The, is, it, is it school vacation week for you too, Paul? It is. Sweet. Um, so, uh, but the uh, CD Project is the company that makes Cyberpunk 2077. They were hit by a ransomware attack. And the ransomware folks were like, hey, we're going to just publish their source code. And the CD Project was like, yeah. I, I don't care. Go ahead. I'm not paying you a dime. Like, they dug their heels in, and, like, uh, I guess at a certain thing, like, good for you. I mean, maybe now the source code's out there. Everyone else can help find bugs. Of course, people would have to read the source code. I can't imagine what that's like for a, a really modern game like that, right? It's got to be insane. It's got to be source insane. It's got to be crazy. I've seen, yeah, I've seen a bunch of stuff up on one of the hacker forums I, I get for breach stuff, and there was a ton of breach notifications, people trying to sell stuff, and half of it fake half of it maybe not fake but it was uh, it was very interesting that uh, they didn't they didn't want to pay anything which is cool mm. yeah it's very uh, it's very eastern block of them yeah cuz the company's in in Poland right yeah mm. yeah it, that's a tough line to hold considering what they claim to have published for them but i'm i'm like kudos to them man hold hold the line it's going to be a rough i think couple of years for them um, for sure, I'm, I have a feeling they have some secret sauce about their source code that they don't feel without. Something didn't get taken. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think I think you're right, Leah. There's probably some component somewhere that you're like, yeah, well, you can have all that source code, but you don't have some of these other utilities than the source code for those that you need to like actually replicate the game or whatever, right? Yep. I mean, yeah, a lot of that, a lot of that's the community, right? And the ability yep. to scale scale that at a large scale and have right. have players that that come in and play together. So just because you stole the source code, like standing up a company to you know, build those servers and, and have it go, it's not like it's an, an Unreal tournament server anymore that you can just spin <laughs> up on a LAN and have some a bunch of people join. It's kind of a little bit different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, there's so much of the back end game engine that they've got to be missing. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, we're, it's pure speculation at this point, but still, uh, you're, I think you're absolutely rightly. There's some secret sauce that they're like, "Yep, you got the code for the game. Whatever, we've got the magic still." So, yeah. yep, mm-hmm. GTFO. Yeah, but I'm sure there's going to get all kinds of people trying to get in their face about what they've done wrong or how they're how they're harmed by it, and they're just going to have to, you know, steal themselves to to to, to carry on. Um, yeah, for whatever reason, they definitely seem to have gotten a lot more flack for bugs in in this particular game and even though you see that you look at a very mature game that has a huge following huge audience uh, something like fortnite there's all kinds of hackers in there there's all kinds of glitches and bugs that people find all the time and you very rarely see anybody complain about that so i'm not sure why such the animosity towards uh, this particular game or company yeah i well for, you know I, I think about it from you know the perspective of the the friends that i see that have played it and and play it um that some of these bugs um you know would actively prevent them from completing stuff in the game to complete the game like they get to a certain point and their system would crash and you can't pass past this point in the game because there was a bug um some of those types of things were, were some of the bugs. I mean, the stuff we see in Fortnite is like, oh, yeah, you can get these extra things, or, you, you know, there's some cheating involved, and it's not that the game crashes and you can't play it. So, I think that's why they took a lot of heat. And it was a game that they, we've been waiting for for Yeah, it was a lot long, of hype. A lot of hype, Larry. A long, long time. I would say, though, the, the age group that Fortnite is targeting, though, it's interesting to see, like, how little patience they have for when the game crashes. Like they, I, we need to do a job of giving them a glimpse into the past. Like, do you know what we had to do to make a game work when it was like DOS? Or like, even do if, you even realize if how like spoiled glitching. you are right now? Like yeah, you're complaining like about this little glitch. To, yeah. My ping's down to 100 and I got like 30 frames per second. I'm dying. Like, seriously? <laughs> yeah, you hear your seven-year-old complaining about lag. You're like, we used to play over dial-up modems, all right? Like, just, really? <laughs> anyway. We had lag and we were glad to have it. That's right. We were just happy to be connected at that point. Yeah. Um, what's interesting is when we talk about being connected in TCP IP, uh, it's been around for a long time. And it just it still amazes me when we've got these uh, bugs in TCP IP. And, and this week, there are two. Microsoft's implementation of the TCP IP stack is found to be vulnerable. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there was a series of CVEs, mostly DOS exploits, uh, allow remote attackers to cause uh, a stop error. Customers re- might receive a blue screen. Wasn't that Smurf? Wasn't the Smurf? Was it Smurf? Smurf. Yeah. Smurf. Blue screen remotely a Windows computer kind of reminded me of mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. That was a lot of fun back in the day. Um, <laughs> and But also, Forescout did uh, some exhaustive research now, they've got this uh, Project Memoria, which is looking at TCP IP stack vulnerabilities. There was a, a previous generation that found a set of vulnerabilities in various embedded TCP IP stacks. This new set is called Number Jack. It's a set of nine new vulnerabilities that are all focused around the ISN, or uh, initial sequence number. Which Ooh. I think is, is interesting because I, I feel like there's a lot of us that really understood that concept and scrutinized the RFCs and implementations and but here we are nine new vulnerabilities affecting uh, largely these embedded TCP IP stacks. I think part of the problem stems from the generation of the ISN using a phone keypad. Yes, you're absolutely it's great analogy, Jeff. <laughs> but I got my decoder ring, Jeff. <laughs> That's it. That's pretty funny. I was hoping John so, would be here to, to comment on this as well. I know this is near and dear to his heart, but 
Was there any uh, proof of concept code or or uh, talk about what that potential vulnerability could lead to? Yeah. Uh, so used to hijack or spoof TCP uh, connections, um, close ongoing connections, cause denial of service, or inject malicious data onto a device, or by or to, <clears throat> bypass authentication. So all the kind of Basically, traditional like TCP uh, hijacking attacks uh, are are in play here. Uh, I mean, we're going like really old school. I mean, these were in, I think, more widespread TCP IP stacks uh, back in the day that were largely fixed, uh, and they've you know found that in a number and they list them out. I link to the uh, the actual paper from Forescout on this, and they list. It's interesting. I have not heard of many of these uh, TCP IP stacks that are relevant to. Uh, embedded systems or IoT devices, uh, Pico TCP, uh, Cyclone TCP. There's a whole bunch of them that are used on uh, Siemens Nucleus Net. Uh, is in oh there. wow, mm. that's interesting. I'm curious, like thinking through how you would attack that. I mean, there's several. Like this would have to be a, a multi-chained attack using something like Yersinia or you know Scapy, uh, and hijacking that TCP because even if you do get you know, that TCP connection and or path, most of the authentication and most of the security is up layers with inside the OSI model. Right. Um, yeah. and there's, Hope you're using there's SSL. And you can there. hijack the yeah. TCP connection, right? But if but, it's SSL, then you got to go through the second step. If it's not... Essentially just breaking it. If it's not, I mean, you can basically... Uh, we're going back. I want to say we did we did this in labs and stuff, right? You would hijack the mm -hmm. connection and be able to spoof it if you can basically yeah. predict the ISN. And if you can spoof it, you can do yeah. some interesting things at that layer, but you're relying on you know, whatever you're communicating with to have the fundamental functions interacting in and doing things at that layer uh, without some very complex code. You can That's certainly still pretty tear down... Interesting. You can certainly tear down connections, right? And because you can spoof, yeah. you can spoof a reset packet and, and tear down that connection. Yep. Which is annoying. I could see things like uh, video. I mean, a lot of the, the modern things like VoIP or video, a lot of those are relying on UDP, but the initial connections for the securing of, mm -hmm. of those UDP you know, start, start vectors are, are happening via TCP. So there may be some interesting things there. Mm. All right. Where yeah. else are we going? So Right. So this 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 is crazy too because I'm I was just reading I'm like this sounds familiar because yeah Four Scout did Amnesia thirty three against IoT protocol stacks yep. last October yes like God they're just it. yeah I mean they're I mean they've got a probably a pretty large research team doing this research and, and doing a great job and publishing it and making the internet a safer place at the end of the day if you know these things are getting fixed hopefully they are but yeah you know yeah well and I actually was wondering you know. Was the old move to IPv6 trick going to work for them? These are these are IPv6 and v4 problems. Mm -hmm. I thought that was interesting. So it had a had a has a deep root in terms of what it's what's being asked, where the vulnerability comes from. Excuse me. Because um, how many people have told us IPv6 it'll be all better? Oh, you've every, been hearing that from yeah, everyone. Yeah, Larry, you had some stories in there. Sorry, I didn't see them until just recently. Uh, yeah, you, of course, you catch me trying to change the batteries on my trackpad because it's dying. No, nope, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Uh, let me uh, switch over here. Um, so, yeah, the one that I uh, didn't get a chance to, to read a whole lot, but it w was kind of like, well, that's interesting. Maybe I should be learning this, rightly, uh, is the oh. new phishing attack that uses Morse code to hide malicious URLs. Like, yeah, that's really cool. Uh, what you know, the there heck? was something with Java, JavaScript in there, but yeah, like let's go back and use a really old technology to encode data so that we can send data using Morse code so that it, when it's decoded, it's a malicious URL. My IDS doesn't have a signature for that. It's about to. <laughs> right? Oh, yeah, right? It's pretty cool. So how are they doing the Morse code? Is it just dot nomenclature with mm -hmm. inside of ascii yep so they they de they create a function for decode morse and they have you know what dot equals s dot dot equals 
uh, sorry, uh, three dots is S, four dots, uh, four dash, three dashes is zero. Uh, God damn it. Oh. Three, yeah, three dots is S, three dashes is O. Uh, yeah. And then they do uh, decode uh, in the code of like, oh, here's all this stuff that will be a malicious URL. No, they uh, Morse code and code it and then have a function that does the decode based on the, the equivalency. Yeah. <clears throat> it's, it's, it's actually pretty cool. And, and they run it through a yeah. phone keypad. Cypher. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. You don't need the full keypad there, Jeff. You just need two of them. You just need dots and, and dashes, dashes. Right. but 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 which two? And that they have that they have this whole algorithm for which figuring out which two numbers to use any given time. Make it make a secret. Yep. yep, it's all good. It's kind of interesting, but that seems like a lot of effort to hide a URL mm. when most of the oh. phishing protections are doing advanced heuristics where they're live checking you know whatever's coming in and and validating it on uh, you know sandbox machine or running through the function of whatever's in there so there's still some caveats to what that achieves because we can you know we can do key encryption we can pass in null characters we can you know do uh http html uh stuffing and and really kind of achieve the same thing which doesn't get us very far because of some of the heuristics that are happening but it's still a, an interesting and novel way to uh, to smuggle something in. And to your point, Tyler, <clears throat> that's why I like the kind of siloed browser technologies that are that are out there. I think it's a pretty good strategy, right? Because there's always going to be ways to encode URLs. There's always going to be ways to trick users into clicking something. Like you know, fighting that battle <laughs> is is getting the file to disk. Yeah. Like if it's encrypted and, and encoded and, and properly keyed, like the file goes to disk and is harmless. Like what you know what are you going to evaluate a bunch of random encrypted data like it's not that's not anything novel that's doing anything it's the execution piece that is really the the hard step to get figured out and and how to get that execution to happen uh, in any environment or specific environments that is is a key variable that can be you know reliably uh, relied upon with something that's asymmetrical mm-hmm uh, have, has anyone done the clubhouse thing? I've been trying to get an invite for a little while. Like no. I've looked at it and I've seen some people that have it and I've done some marketing, um, some marketing training on it. Uh, but I've not gotten into it yet. I've watched a few of the videos of videos, but it's interesting. It's just, it's just voice. So yeah. it's so I, I've got, not really great yet. I've got an Android phone. So even if I had an invite, I'd have to go find an iOS device yep. somewhere to uh, to use it. So, which is weird. Like, why why isolate yourself to half the demographic? Well, so what I heard on that is kind of interesting, and I heard an Instagram uh, had done this, and this is not you know like a security thing, right? It's kind of like a Silicon Valley startup uh, tactic, is they gain as much use, as many users as they can on an iOS platform. And then if they're going for some kind of funding or an acquisition, they're, they're working on the Android release in the background. And then what Instagram did before Facebook bought them is they released the Android version. They increased their user subscriber base by a large percentage and like, hey, look at our growth. Like we can totally stand by all of our numbers and you should acquire us for, you know, billions of dollars. Uh, and Facebook was, I, what I was told, is was kind of aware of this when it happened with Instagram. And they're like, yeah, that's a play. Like, we're not going to hold it against you. Um, but, like, we know what you're doing. And, like, whatever. We're still going to buy you. And that's what Clubhouse is doing is that uh, they're kind of banking on, like, the, the next big stage in the company when we need that spike in growth. Well, just, it's organic. I can just release the Android and everyone who's Android is going to start using Clubhouse. And there goes our use of subscriptions uh, up. So, um, but there are, you know, this is... To me, it's kind of a similar thing to, to a Snapchat, right? Where nothing on the internet is is private. And I think that's one of the things that Clubhouse is trying to build its company on is like, oh, you can have conversations and they won't be recorded. But that 
that's not necessarily true. And there was an article posted to uh, to Medium uh, by someone in security that was talking about in-app audio chats uh, are believed to be deleted. But if you read the fine print, like only if there was a trust and safety violation are they deleted. So they're still storing the chats. There's also some things where it stores your contacts. Like if you allow it access to your contacts, it could store your contacts. So, uh, I mean, don't think these, you know, big Silicon Valley startups like really care about your security and privacy. They care about getting to the next stage of the company. To be honest. And, and how are they, they going to get said, that funding? Yep. And, and Paul, you said these are audio chats, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, so uh, Clubhouse, uh, the way it works is uh, it's invite only. Mm -hmm. Then you can invite your friends and basically spin up a, a, a room uh, and one person can talk uh, during this. And it's kind of like a uh, talk radio kind of thing. So I'm talking as a host and then Larry, you raise your hand and I say, oh, Larry, it's your turn to talk and, and you can interject. And only if I allow you to talk, can you talk? Um, so it's used by a lot of high profile Silicon Valley people. Uh, Elon Musk uh, was using it uh, to, to broadcast some like meetings and stuff like that and the interviews he was doing, I guess. Um, and so it's a way to communicate without uh, you know, there being a recording or some kind of record of it, right? Like, it's uh, kind of like a, you know, the, and, and, the tweet thing that was like, oh, we have stories and you can, like, make a tweet and then it disappears. This is like the yep. audio version of that. So so it's it's kind of along the lines of, you know, they forgot the analog loophole, as it were. Yes, exactly. Like, like I could output the audio from my speakers and my microphone split that off do some put it into some recording gear and you know capture the hdmi output from my laptop to a monitor and right i've got all those things like yeah the analog to the i mean you can put lots of restrictions on the app that like you know connected devices and other apps can't access <clears throat> the audio stream but at the end of the day it's physics audio is in the air <laughs> as radio right. waves yeah. that can yeah. be yeah. You, you could get a microphone put your phone on and i guess you can only do it with your phone on speaker. Okay, there's some, so that, there's that some makes it even better because I'll just take another phone and reset it here and record. My yeah, computer. so hey, you take my, a microphone uh, and you can record it, right? Yeah, so they tried to put restrictions around. That's why I kind of liken it to Snapchat where, you know, when Snapchat came out, people were like, oh, I can share pictures and, like, no one can save them or take screenshots of them. But, like, I can be standing over someone's shoulder and take a picture of your phone. Like, how are you going to prevent that? You can't, right? Um, privacy screen, dude. Yep. There, is, yep. I mean, there are ways to <laughs> mitigate that, but not completely. Yep. No. So, Paul, speaking of uh, uh, pictures, uh, my story number four, uh, which is entitled "Blur" on Twitter, um, is a little bit of a thread from Twitter about something that was just dumb. Like people don't know how to redact stuff. Um, the Waikato Police Department posted a picture on Twitter of their new um, undercover vehicle, but they made it all black so you couldn't tell what it was. Like, first I saw it, I'm like, did they get, like, you know, the a car and paint it Vanta black or something like that? No, they just... They Photoshopped the picture. And apparently, by taking the picture and pulling it into Photoshop uh, and adjusting some levels just <laughs> reveals the vehicle um, in, like... A, 10 seconds and then other folks are chiming in like oh hey by the way if you just pull this picture into paint and you go and do the bucket tool and pick a different color it reveals the vehicle and the license plate if you click in a whole bunch of spots or if you just zoom into the window of the cop car next to it you can get more like you can start uh... to figure out what the car is <laughs> and, <laughs> oh my god like, yeah there's like <laughs> videos of people just like revealing the car is that an acura or a mercedes i can't tell looks like an acura uh, to me looks like an acura right or is it something else no i think I it's think an acura it's something else the, the the logo doesn't look like an acura to me mm. but i don't know what it is you can definitely see the license plate in one of the yeah oh, yeah that's a, yeah. Uh, Images are not yeah, safe. Like, I know. No. No. Like well, oh, dirt. Unless you save it as something else that doesn't have all the metadata from before. Yep. And as Larry can tell you, metadata is a thing. Also, with yep. respect to the police, um, it, I, I saw this uh, post, and I, I actually watched some of the videos, and 
I, you know, when, when things happen that involve police officers, you know, everyone's got their phone out and they're, they're taking video of it. And oh, there, was, yeah. there was this particular police officer, and I don't pretend to know the story. I don't know if this is a good person or a bad person, so I'm not throwing that judgment out there because I, I, I don't have enough evidence to make that determination, mm. right? But if it's a story I think of, it's an interesting loophole. So it is continue. an interesting loophole that if you are someone, police officer or not, that you don't want people taking a video of you and then posting it to a popular social media site, if you play a song that is copyrighted, and the person takes a video of you and that song is in the background inside the video, when you post it to Instagram or YouTube or whatever, it'll get flagged as copyrighted material and you'll have trouble keeping that video public. Which I, that's kind that's of That's very dicey. interesting. Yeah. But it's interesting yeah. uh, interesting kind of kind of hack, if you will, a life hack, uh, into uh, you know, preventing people from posting videos of you online. Yep. Does and, that mean that it's inadmissible it was... in court? Because that potentially has to be public record at some point. Yeah, I'm not. That's a good question. Yeah, I'm not sure. And, and you know, that's a, you know one of the things that I read to get to add to that life hack. Um, play uh, Disney songs uh, because you know Disney is absolutely right. vicious about taking those stuff down. Like one of the the biggest like contenders for doing that type of stuff, as opposed to some of the other record labels and stuff. No, yeah, it's a great point. You could definitely. Uh, increase your chances in this life hacking by choosing brands and companies that have copyrighted material that go through great lengths, greater lengths than others to protect. Mm -hmm. Nike is notorious for protecting the swoosh with, you know, great force. They have the most amazing team uh, of lawyers protecting that. And you're right, like Disney does an amazing job of trying to protect its its content. I thought it was um, an interesting little hack. So I had a question i remember I, it's been a long time since i've tried to post a video that had copyrighted music but l when i last time i did it it posted the video but it wiped out the audio channel it just made it a silent movie right is yeah. that still what they do or they block it entirely now well so youtube and fortunately it's been a while since i've had to deal with this but uh youtube will flag your video for copyrighted content they will tell you that you cannot monetize that video because it contains copyrighted content. They will leave the video posted public, and this varies, but largely they'll leave the video posted to your channel and they'll give you an opportunity to deal with that uh, copyrighted material. And they advance mm -hmm. to a point where um, you don't have to blank out all of the sound. They'll actually tell you like, the copyrighted song you're playing is at these time markers. Like, do you just want to remove the song, just the song from this particular time marker? And you can go yes, and it'll remove the copyrighted material, and then you could monetize the video uh, if you wanted to. Yeah. I used to do that in some of our videos, even though we weren't monetizing. I was try just trying to show YouTube that we were being a good citizen, so they didn't suspend our channel for any reason. Like <laughs> I was hoping yeah. it played into their algorithm, because they don't tell you how their algorithms work, right? I was hoping it played into their algorithm somehow, that if I would do that, I'd be listed as a good citizen. So, I don't so, know so YouTube as a service for editing my videos, and I don't have to do that manually. Correct. It's once it's uploaded to YouTube. Yep, it had a, a tool. Uh, I don't know if you could swap <laughs> it out with something else, but you could certainly like uh, remove that clip of that audio of the copyright. That's material. great. Yeah, it's pretty good. <laughs> it's interesting. It's not still, perfect either. There was some. There was some music that we uh, composed in internally. Yeah that was flagged for copyright and i was like no we composed that internally in their basically their machine learning algorithms weren't perfect and it mistook it from another a piece of work and as we know music can sound similar and there's we could do a whole segment on that right but yeah it's not perfect huh. it's interesting and it's an interesting hack life hack you're right it's kind of cool mm. What else we got? Lee, you got a couple stories in there. Yeah, I do. I was, uh, the, I mean, the big one I wanted to talk about, we covered already. Um, and uh, actually three of them we've, we've talked about. But uh, I thought it was interesting that they uh, there was a story about, you know, pulling down the world's largest fishing service, you admin, uh, which was a, one, of the, one of those multinational um, takedowns. U.S. Ukrainian. I'm sure there was more. If I don't, I don't remember all the players involved. Um, 
I do remember there was, I, this one didn't have one, but sometimes they put out the video of them break, you know, taking down these places. And they're, they're crazy little places that it's amazing. What It's like they're underground or in the basement. And mm -hmm. there's like all this, yeah, all kinds of cool IT all the, most of the time. Um, Comple completely but, opposite of the Emotet takedown which yeah. was in some you know western block apartment building you know disheveled run down and running like windows 7 on a pc case, on a pc with no case type of thing yeah so completely yeah. opposite it was like 50 percent of the 2019 australia hacks were uh phishing attacks excuse me were used their their software but somewhere and i don't see it now there was a little gotcha that although this guy got took taken down, he he sold his software to somebody else before he was taken out of business. So it'll be back, um, which is a, I think back. a little bit of a up yours at the end. Um, I gotta find that. Uh, but I do think it's interesting we're seeing more of these multinational takedowns of. Uh, I mean, I think we all remember the the first one we probably all remember was in Cuckoo's Egg, right? where it was right. Germany and U.S., mm -hmm. and then it kind of went away. But this last year or so, this, there's been a lot of them, particularly the last few months. And a, and a couple in, in Ukraine, which I think is interesting. Yeah. I started listening to a new audio book, This Is How They Tell Me the World Ends. Um, oh. And uh, I, I just started it. And it's interesting, I was listening to it with, with my oldest son, and they, they started by kind of chronicling some of the... Uh, attacks uh, that were carried out by Russia against the Ukraine, basically setting up that like Russia basically practiced election hacking in Ukraine with purpose, mind you. And then uh, I believe with the I've read about the book, it's going to kind of carry into the the 2016 uh, election hacking and chronicle some of those events. And so I'm listening to this whole thing, and I you know I asked my son, I'm like. So, do you know, like, the relationship between Russia and Ukraine? He's like, I have no idea. And I'm like, well, like, like, first of all, like, what do they teach you in school, by the way? Like, what do they teach you in history? <laughs> it's, pro it's, pro it's probably still a little bit early for him, yeah. Probably, but. yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he's, uh, he's in seventh grade, right? So, uh, <clears throat> but anyway, I'm like, well, this is relevant to cybersecurity especially, right? I'm like, but think about if there was a U.S. state... Right, they basically said we want to break away from the U.S. and they did that, and then the U.S. basically hacked into that state and tried to mess up everything uh, in that state that was now its own country. I'm like, that's kind of the relationship between Russia and Ukraine. And he was like, yeah, that, that's that's great, Dad. I am going to school now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yep. Hard yep. to you know, get them I'll, excited I'll, about that about that yep. stuff in in a short car ride to school, but yeah. Yep. Al along those lines, uh, you know, uh, our oldest is uh, a year older. Um, but, uh, the last couple weekends we've spent watching with her, um, the HBO, uh, mini series that is now available mm. on Netflix, uh, Chernobyl. Yeah. Yeah. I and, think that's, uh, yeah, I think that's a good one for, yeah, yeah to watch it, with your older, older children. I think, yeah, it's, yeah. it gets to be a little gruesome, but like just by the time you get about past the second episode out of the five, it's like, Yeah. It's a really yeah, it fascinating. A it's a fascinating dynamic, and I think also for those you know in cybersecurity to understand the history between the history of Ukraine and the history between Russia and Ukraine, because you know they started describing attacks. Um, they, they got they didn't get into Chernobyl, but they mentioned Chernobyl, and they're like you know the control systems that are monitoring the radioactivity still today in Chernobyl were taken down as part of this attack, and, and I turned to my son. I'm like that. That's what they call not petia. He's like, yeah, that's that's nice. He's like on his phone. Yeah, that's nice, Dad. Right? <laughs> like you know, teenage teenage kids. But um, yeah, it's really I interesting how that plays into so much in, in cybersecurity and, and trying to understand the the relationship between those countries is uh, kind of tees you up for understanding not petia, the power grid attacks and all and all that stuff. It's really interesting. And it's even even then it's hard from an American standpoint to fully grasp the not just the geopolitical but the the cultural uh weight of a lot of that mm. i mean not not even just ukraine there's the, anybody on the eastern bloc and looking yep. at how world war one started and, and some of the the things that transpired to world war two from kind of those countries that are, are very little 
or or not well known. Uh, there's yeah. some very very interesting stuff. Yeah, and Tyler, my my analogy when I was explaining to my son, I was it was kind of like you know Russia tried to put in a president of Ukraine that was on the side of Russia. Is that that was part of the story, correct? It was like Putin's buddy, basically. They were trying to put as a president of Ukraine. I was like, you, liken, right? liken that to the U.S. That would be if one of the U.S. states broke away and the U.S. tried to put someone in power of that state that had broken away. I was, I was just, yeah. It's a lot of, lot of study there that relates to a lot of cybersecurity stuff as well. So, Lee. So I, I just got this one from from Shelly, my wife, and I think it's it's actually some. It's not a cyber story. Late breaking um, news. It's it's a story on from Popular Sciences on 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 twenty great uses for WD forty, and I'm thinking about the East Coast with all the snow because number sixteen is it keeps snow from sticking to your snow shovel, and I just thought with all the bad weather we've had across the nation, that's freaking hilarious. I know it's not a cyber story, but I just Tacking thought, there. holy crap. Tacking. And, oh, by the way, use number 13. It keeps the sting out of fire ant bites for you campers out there. <laughs> um, so, like I said, I just thought it was something fun because we've had some not fun stories tonight. Right. And I did put it in the show notes. I just put it if you're looking at A lot of ads I find in, in some of those articles, too. I get, oh, I get nervous. Crazy fun. With, yeah, with the ad tracking on those. For sure. And uh, so, like I said, I just thought that was something a little different. Uh, Microsoft's remote desktop web access vulnerability. Uh, Ty, I don't know if you saw this one. This one seems like something that would pique your interest. Um, I didn't get a read on it. I've, it's on my uh, it's on my follow up list for this week. It, but it looks does like look super fascinating. Yeah. So the remote desktop web access service um, can do things like validate usernames within an Active Directory domain. Then furthermore, expose the connected domain name of the RPC endpoint and it's accessible on the target server, um, and they can use it to gather intelligence. That's a pretty neat write-up. Yeah, it's a it's a cool it's a cool method, and we have some other similar ways of doing that 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 are you know very very close to that. But this was a kind of a novel way to to do that, especially with that being exposed, uh, which which it almost always is. So. Uh, yeah, that's on. It's on my homework from work to to uh, get a write up done on it. So sweet. Any other stories? I got one last one. Let's do it. Um, yeah, I we we talk about IoT, Paul, but uh, the Henry Ford cardiologist finds that the magnet, the iPhone 12, can um, deactivate um, pacemakers, or as they play implantable cardiac devices. Yeah. So they what? use magnets to be able to control the device uh, as opposed to performing surgery uh, and all that type of stuff. Uh, and a quote from the article, uh, when we brought the iPhone close to the patient's chest, the defibrillator was deactivated. We saw on the external defibrillator programmer that the functions of the device were suspended and remained suspended. When we took the phone away from the patient's chest, the defibrillator immediately returned to its normal function. Now, defibrillator, not pacemaker, right? Defibrillator, or pacemaker. Yeah. So defibrillator. Like, um, yeah, defibrillator. Like in-body defibrillator. Yep. Holy shit. Wow. That's yep. bad. That's a little... Mm. Wow. Who did not think that one all the way through? Like how many things use magnetic fields? Wait, you're talking what? about the iPhone or the defibrillator? The defibrillator. <laughs> <laughs> I guess both now. <laughs> yep. My, now my question is, why does the iPhone 12 have a magnet in it? You're like, don't put it next to your spinning drive. Because everything click. Remember the the stupid commercial with the with the fancy the fancy you know hipster style visuals. Everything clicks to it. It's oh, all so like you you can like put the pop socket on, or you can put your keyboard on, and like click and your charger. And, okay. Yeah. Yep. I get it. It's, it's like it's like the old Mac uh, magnet chargers. It's yeah, like everything's magnetized adapters. now. So they got a whole market for magnetized things. There's rumors of those coming back, and there's also rumors that Apple's going to come out with a car, which you can just. What? I mean, the jokes just write themselves about Apple coming out with a car. Yeah, that, I, I mean, heard the rumors they got their own processor that, now, so why not just jump to a car? Right. Yep. 
I, I heard the rumors that they were partnering with Hyundai. Yes. And that, that apparently fell through. So... Yeah, because the fact that we heard rumors that it was Hyundai probably soiled that relationship with Apple. That's like, you're not supposed to talk about anything that we're going to be doing, and that's mm-hmm. bad. Yep. Yep. Oh, well. Oh, well. Anybody else? I think that concludes this edition of Security Weekly News. We will now air our pre-recorded interview with Wheel, one of the security researchers from Qualys that was able to uncover the vulnerability in Pseudo that dates back Pseudo code to 1986. That's coming up next.